So I'd just like to say welcome. Uh, welcome to our house. Uh, we like to call it the home of exploration and adventure. This is the place where ideas come to life. Uh, I'm Declan Moore. I'm the CEO of National Geographic Partners. And I'm delighted to partner with the Webby Awards to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Webby Awards here tonight. Now, you know, we have a long tradition of storytelling firsts here at National Geographic. From the first published colored photograph to the first photo taken with a flash, from the first color documentary that was broadcast on US television to being the first publisher on the iPad. We have been pioneering the new media frontier, whether it has been with Facebook Instant Articles, with Apple Newsreader, or on Snapchat Discover. And I'm delighted to share um, our storytelling on those platforms with you tonight. Exploration, you see, is in our DNA. Now, one of the reasons that we created National Geographic Partners was so we can accelerate our storytelling in the digital age. With a beachhead that we've established on television with the world's most widely distributed channel, we're doubling down on delivering more of the National Geographic storytelling experience across more platforms than ever before, extending our brand leadership position on Instagram, where we have maintained a commercial-free existence, or to the Apple News Reader, or onto Snapchat, where we're proving that when we do our storytelling in the right way to reach uh, in the right way on the right platform, we get rewarded by audience and by engagement. And it's really exciting to us that we can build on the leadership position that we've had on our print platforms and on television throughout our 128 year history, we just celebrated our birthday last week, onto the new emerging platforms of today. Now it's a really exciting time for us to be at the intersection of cause-related storytelling that makes a difference. How can you not but be moved by Aaron Huey's photographs from Denali as part of our year-long celebration of the National Parks Movement. And incidentally, National Geographic was a key instigator of the formation of the National Park Service. Or Lindsay Dario's changing face of Saudi Arabian women in the latest issue of the print magazine, which you will receive on your way out, but which, of course, we have already posted online. We are the only media company to invest such a large share of our proceeds directly into science, exploration, research, conservation, and education. When we talk about being purpose-driven, we don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. So swipe right for Nat Geo. We can't be stopped. <laughs> the internet can't be stopped. You're going to hear from what I call our A-team tonight. And it's not just because they're named Asher and Anand and Aaron and Anjali, although that's an interesting coincidence. Um, but it's my great pleasure, before I turn into uh, DJ Monotone, uh, to introduce David Michelle Davies, who's president of the Webby Awards. No one knows the internet better than David Michelle, whether it's a cutting edge mobile app or a hilarious viral video. And he's the guy who can reward us all for our efforts. Thank you, David Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. So nice to have you here. I want to thank um, our friends at National Geographic Society and National, Ge Na National Geographic Partners. Um, it's so meaningful that, that you guys have had us here tonight to be able to work with you on this event and to have all these people, I think, which is such a nice, it was such a nice little, uh, not little, such a nice event and a beautiful space and really um, such a pleasure. Um, I remember as a child, there was National Geographic and it was the age of magazines and always, it stood for exceptional quality content, exceptional photography. And as I've grown up, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am now, and watch the media landscape change, the one constant, really, if you think about it, National Geographic, on every platform, always evolving, always exceptional content. Um, and that's a really meaningful thing. 128 years, not totally surprising, although I was thinking more like 90 or something. but. Uh, <laughs> So thank you so much. It's been really wonderful for us to honor you guys at the Webbies. You obviously deserve it, and it's been wonderful. Um, I'm not going to talk for more than a minute or two. Uh, you know, it's our 20th year at the Webbies this year. We're super excited about it. We were trying to figure out a way. I was trying to figure out a way to tell all of you that it was our 20th year for like five months in a row without just saying it was our 20th year. Um, so we came up with, I think, what was kind of an internet-y way of celebrating it this year. We reached out to some companies, some organizations, like National Geographic, like Facebook, like Google, like Tumblr, um, many others, and some companies that won some of the most Webbies, and asked them to respond to a brief. It's up there on the wall on the, on the board. 
The internet can't be stopped. Uh, it's been great to see all of the responses. They're all on our site. We started off with a print campaign. Just lot, here's one of the pieces. This is what Nation, National Geographic did. Um, and just a lot of different takes on this concept. Uh, the words, those five words, are meant to mean what you think they mean. Um, for us, what we saw after 20 years was an internet that was at once transformational. We've all talked about this a million times. I mean, how many different societies, industries, friendships has the internet transformed? We could go on and on. Um, and for us, as like the groupies of the internet, like we're sitting here rooting from the sidelines, go internet, you know, we love the internet. Um, we're sort of more on the side of, of, of celebrating that transformation. But if you look at media in general and culture at large, I think you see this ongoing discussion about the role technology is playing in our lives, about the role it's going to play in the future, um, from awesome television shows uh, like Black Mirror to films like Her and Ex Machina to articles written about drones and crypto technology taking over the world and journalism. I mean, on and on, there is a conversation happening out there about what role technology is going to play in our lives. And that's sort of what we wanted to explore this year. And it's been really fun. We've had the opportunity to um, work with folks at National Geographic, um, have events like this, have events in London looking at the future of music and technology, looking at the future of comedy and the internet in Los Angeles. It's been such a great, great, great time. And um, I encourage you, if you haven't, to check out. We have a lot of great content on the site. Um, that's about it. Tonight, though, um, we are going to talk to uh, three National Geographic photographers. The A-team, as they're called. So people, and I think what you'll see here is that these are people who are really pushing the boundaries and exploring a totally diverse part of the world using, photographer, using photography. And so um, the topics that they explore, the actual images that they're going to show you, and what interests them is just so diverse and so interesting. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to them a bit about the way technology and the internet's transforming not only their work, how it's reaching people, and the experiences that they're having out there while they're getting all this photography. So that's what we're going to talk about. They're going to show you some of their work, which is really quite amazing. I think you're going to be psyched to see it. I thought, you know what, it is our 20th year. I have 19 years of Webby Awards in a two-minute clip. I thought I'd show you in case you haven't been to all 19. Um, <laughs> so let's play that, and then we'll bring up our photographers. Sergey Brin and Larry Page of Google. Google is used over 100 million times today now. A hundred million times? Uh, do you get a penny a time? I wish. It's Webby time again! Hollywood's got the Oscars, TV has the Emmys, so what does the World Wide Web have to say for itself? This is the night where the best and brightest on the internet meet face to face, look at each other, and all say, you are not what I expected either. Huffington, the Meryl Streep of the Webbies. I didn't kill newspapers, okay? Sometimes geeks can be chic. I'm a Webby. One of the greatest things about the Webby Awards is the five word acceptance speech. How am I on time? Oh, shit. Only get five words. Shit, that was fine. Me! No Jerry's uh, five-word speech. It's going to be, I can buy this place. Why five words? It, it doesn't. Thank God Conan got promoted. He's just a funny mother isn't he? The Oscars should do this. That's enough! You guys know damn well that my childhood dream has always, always been to deliver a Webby Award acceptance speech. This here requires no filter. Everything you think is true. They broke. The internet is the most powerful megaphone we have to make sure that that message is heard. Like many of you, the first thing I thought was, who the f is Louis C.K.? When I die, bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's the show, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Good night. We had some fun in 19 years, right? We had a good time. All right. Super excited to int introduce to you National Geographic photographer Anand Varna. Come on up. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. So 
I did not actually set out to become a photographer. My plan was to be a scientist. And I happened upon a summer job uh, as a photography assistant, and I realized there was a way to bridge these two worlds between science and photography. And by doing that, I could get to explore the world and then share what I found with everyone else. So what I'm going to show you today is the last story I did for National Geographic magazine. And I'm going to walk you through some of my thought processes as I planned out the kind of content that I wanted to produce. So it's a story on honeybees. And as you may know, honeybees are dealing with all these problems. And the question I had was, what are researchers doing about it? And what does that scientific process look like? So what you're looking at here is a baby honeybee just as it's emerging from its brood cell. And one of the biggest problems that honeybees are dealing with in North America and Europe are these parasitic mites, which are two millimeters wide. They crawl into the hive. They chew on the baby bees. They bring in diseases. And they eventually wipe out the colony. And one of the ways that people are, are dealing with this is they're actually artificially breeding bees in labs. So this is a USDA bee lab in Baton Rouge. They've sedated the queen bee. They're injecting her with semen they've collected with male, from males. And they're actually able to breed mite-resistant bees, which they then take. And this is, a, this is one of those queens of the mite-resistant bees. And you can see her surrounded by nurse bees, which are feeding her. And they take these queens out to the largest beekeeper in the world. This is Brett A.D. with his 72,000 hives. And they're trying to figure out, can they get these lab-bred bees to survive out in the wild? And how, how well they do, do they do out there? And one of the other issues that researchers are concerned about is pesticides. So this is an experiment where they're looking to see the effect of this pesticide on a bee that's been sedated with carbon dioxide. Here, they're growing baby bees in incubators and seeing how pesticides affect bees at the larval stage. And here, they're running an experiment to see how pesticides affect the memory and learning ability of bees. The way this works is they put the bee in this little straitjacket, this plastic straitjacket. They give it a puff of scented air, and then they give it a sugar reward that's a Q-tip dipped in sugar. And they wait a while. They give it another puff. And if the bee sticks out its tongue, you know that's a smart bee. It's learned to associate that stimulus with the reward. And by doing that, they can tell that you, you, you run this experiment with a bunch of bees that have been exposed to pesticides, and you can see their memories being affected far before they're actually being killed by that chemical. And so that has devastating effects for the colony as a whole. Now, when I started working on this project, before I went to all these labs, I decided I wanted to learn as much as I could about bees. And I did that by starting a beehive in my backyard, which turns out to be more complicated than I anticipated. So, this is uh, me trying to retrieve a swarm of bees that went into my neighbor's yard. Oh. So obviously not uh, a master beekeeper. But you know, the great thing about this. Are you okay? They seem pretty chill. <laughs> the great thing about keeping bees is I got to just go in my backyard and watch this crazy bee society do its thing. And I, and I had this idea of how to show the day in the life of a queen bee. And I did that by gluing a little fluorescent tag on her back, a UV fluorescent tag, and then turning on a black light to increase the contrast. And then I took a time lapse as she moved around her hive. And so you get a sense for how she moves around there. And what she's doing every time she pauses, she's looking for a place to lay her egg, which cell she's going to choose. And I started thinking about, OK, what does that process look like? I mean, to go from an egg to a bee, that must look crazy. So I worked with UC Davis Bee Lab, and they helped me figure out how to raise bees in front of a camera inside an incubator. So I'm going to show you the first 21 days of a bee's life condensed into 60 seconds. This is a bee egg as it hatches into a larva. Those larvae then swim around their cells, feeding on this white goo that nurse bees secrete for them. Then the larva transforms into pupa, and its head and its legs start to differentiate. This is that same pupation process again, sped up from a different angle. You can see actually these mites running around in the cells. Then the tissue reorganizes in their head, and the pigment develops in their eyes. The 
last step of the process is their skin shrivels up and they sprout hair. So the cool thing at the end there, when you saw this, their tongue sticking out and they were kind of licking each other, that's a behavior called trophallaxis. And nobody actually knew that these bees did that at this life stage until I took this time lapse. So you know, technically, my job is to go out there and document the research that's going on on this issue. But back home, I'm sort of hacking together these little visual experiments just to see what happens. And I was able to contribute some small part to the scientific understanding of this creature. And from the beginning, I'm thinking about, OK, what are the platforms that this content can go on? But with a one to two year production schedule for a magazine story, I mean, platforms come and go. So really, the lesson I learned was you know, make as much cool shit as possible <laughs> and then figure out what to do with it later. And so what happened in this case is Facebook came to National Geographic and they said, look, we're developing this new platform called Instant Articles. Do you have a story we can use to launch this? And Bees was ready to go because I'd been trying all these little visual experiments. We had a lot of different dimensions we could bring to it. So I ended up shooting a little bit of high-speed video of Bees as kind of an opener to this article. And that got incorporated. This is kind of what you, you would see on the phone. And so you can sort of scroll through it. It loads instantly from your Facebook feed. And you're able to use the phone's accelerometer to explore the images, pan back and forth. We built little animations for being able to see how the bee licks and so forth. So to me, this raises a question about, OK, what about uh, motion graphics overlays? Or a way to take the information that you can capture in a blended exposure still image, can you overlay that onto video and, and add more information? Is there value in allowing the user to manipulate and, and uh, interact with that information? Will that teach them something new? You know, what's the right balance between carefully curating that space versus just creating this place for somebody to explore and learn something on their own? And for me, the question I ask myself for every story is, what do I do with someone's attention once I have them engaged? I mean, that's such a precious resource I don't want to squander. And my goal is to inspire people by showing them something unexpected. And if I can add to the body of scientific knowledge in the process, that's even better. And I haven't found a place to combine science, storytelling, and education like National Geographic. So thank you very much. All right. Hello again. All right, so thank you, Anand, for your wonderful presentation. I don't think I'll ever see bees or bee stings the same way again. So thank you. Um, so next up, we have Miss Asher J to do her presentation. But let me tell you a little bit about Miss Asher J here. She is a designer, artist, writer, and activist who uses creative concepts and design to advance animal rights, sustainable development, and humanitarian causes. Her art, sculpture, design installations, films, and advocacy advertising campaigns bring attention to everything from oil spills and dolphin slaughters to shrinking lion populations. Much of her best work, much of her best known work, spotlights the illegal ivory trade, including a huge animated billboard in Times Square and an ambitious project aimed at China's ivory-hungry rising middle class. She participated in the Fabergé Big Egg Hunt in New York, because we all love New York values, don't we? Where her, where her oval ove went on to raise money for anti-poaching efforts in Ambos Ambozeli, Kenya. Upcoming projects will tackle biodiversity loss during the Anthropocene and expose threats to the world's most traded and endangered megafauna. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Asher J. So you know how he said that the internet is an unstoppable force? I think connection is why we enable the internet. And connection is the unstoppable force that we empower through storytelling. And my process utilizes internet as one conduit of many to tell the stories of our time. 
So I'm a multimedia artist and a creative conservationist, that's a label I came up with. Um, and that's how I basically convey the relevant stories of our time to the masses. Because I want to democratize information and get as many people as possible in the know. Because it's not an elite circle. Academic information cannot remain within the select few. So here's me out in the field. Um, I've realized over time that wild is my resilient passion. It is what I wake up to. It's what I'm intoxicated by. I cannot live without it. So wild is why I do what I do. And I find different conduits through which I tell stories, one of which is lectures, um, which I think is an effective medium. And of course, conducting workshops for various members, including in Africa, where if you empower the staff and the locals to know what to do with their own resources, management is enabled in a way that we as outsiders cannot. And ultimately, what I'm trying to do is get the people to rewild themselves, to reconnect to what we come from, which is wild. And we have gotten disengaged over time. And that's because of the way we've chosen to live our lives out. And technology has played both a positive and negative role in basically dissuading us from feeling wild on a daily basis. So uh, my, some of the stories I focus on is about how we discover wild and how quickly we lose it. Because biodiversity loss in our time, the age of man, is so rampant, we cannot even count the numbers anymore. We don't know how many species we stand to lose just by being here in this room in these minutes. Um, and that previous campaign just shows how an exclamation point can be used to convey a story. And you know how people say that we're made of stardust. I say we're made of stories. And National Geographic is one place in which I've had the, the privilege to communicate the stories of our time. And the first story I ever told to anyone, much less to the public, through social media and through magazines was about the BP oil spill. I figured at that point that the only way I could internalize this issue that seemed so overwhelming to me as an individual who was working in the fashion industry at that point was to find a way to articulate it. So I started contrasting positive space with negative space using really f like simple visual vocabulary to communicate to the general public what I began to understand as the crux of the problem, which was that we're powering life with death. And so we've evolved it into the Grim Reaper. And so if I were to break down stories and the elements that compose stories into the bare basics, you know, I would say keep it really simple. Because the more complex it becomes, the less succinct it is, in which case you're already losing the audience and you're not conveying the story as effectively as you can. And I would say keep it interactive, because in this generation, if we're not engaging the viewers and taking it one step further by asking them for their input, if there's not a feedback loop there, we are going to lose them. And their attention span is already down to 140 characters. So we're pretty, we're really like at the bo bottom of the barrel. And you have to be persuasive. So if you don't convince your viewers that they need to be bought in by the story, that they need to be on board, and that they need to remember this in their own lives and find application for it, they will not take it in with them. They will not leave that room, leave that space, leave the, the moment of tweeting with that information that you're trying to impart to them. And the way you do that is to have it character driven, you know, to find a protagonist. Who is the person through which the story is being channeled? Is it a rhino? Is it a beverage? Is it a Tampax commercial? What are, you, what are you trying to sell and who are you trying to sell it to? So I'm always looking at the key demographics that I'm trying to convey my, my story to. And then you're thinking about sequence because we need a timeline. We need people to move through time because that's the reality with which we embrace our everyday activities and that makes sense to us. So if the brain can't interpret that over the course of being subjected to whatever experience you put them through, whether it's through virtual reality or through an online campaign, if they don't feel like they've progressed in some manner through it, they're not going to take it in with them and they're not going to spread the word about it and it'll stop right there. So there's a level of stagnancy to it. That's when delivery comes into account. So I always think about the ways in which my campaigns get out there. Am I doing it through the internet? Am I doing it on a billboard? Am I installing a design sculpture like a Fabergé egg in front of t like um, the NBC Universal Studios? You know, it depends. The location, the place, the time, all of it does matter. Because ultimately what you're trying to do is result in a physiological arousal, by which I mean the human body 
inherently changes, the brain chemistry changes, the blood chemistry changes when you encounter a really good story. Because your blood lights up, you know, with oxytocin and cortisol, which is the distress hormone and the empathy hormone. And you light up with your brain chemistry where you're activating aspects of a sensory experience. When I talk to you about me being trapped in a tent, and I, and I wake up in the middle of the night, and there are lines around my tent, and the reason I wake up is because they're breathing me in. You can feel that moment. You're transported to my tent in the Serengeti. And that's the amazing thing about a really good story, is that it enables neural coupling, where all of you get on board and experience what I'm experiencing. And to push it further, that you actually begin to mirror it. You're in my shoes now. And you begin, and it's not just you're, you're in my shoes, you're all in the same shoes. So you share a sense of community while you're gathered around a storyteller. And that's the most incredible thing about stories is that it enables communities. And every time I have an audience, I'm just amazed by the fact that this is my family right now. This is who I'm connected to, and this is who I get to impart my stories to. Because ultimately what we're trying to do is get people to extend the stories that we are putting out there as a part of their own voice and what they stand for. Each one of these images shows campaigns that I put out there to the point where a woman actually tattooed one of my images onto her back. And that's not the first time that somebody has done something like that. It just goes to show the, the extent to which an individual can internalize a story and embody it. So I look at transmedia, which is to say that it's not just about multimedia, where you're trying to combine different types of media together, but that you're trying to use different platforms to get a single message out. Because we're trying to reach a, a certain end goal, which is to protect various species. In my case, it's always megafauna, because they're the most iconic animals to get behind. But off late, I've started working with frogs and birds, because they need PR too. And so this particular image just shows a, a, a photograph that I shot of a line from beneath her. She didn't know I was there in the beginning, but then she assessed that I was, and it was an interesting story, to say the least. Um, and I basically wanted to communicate more than what was there in that moment, which is to show the future of lions in Africa. I mean, this is a very conceptual piece, and I can go into it in greater detail in person later. But this particular image inspired a whole idea of working with big cats in interesting conceptual ways. So I pitched National Geographic Channel about doing this particular animation, which I'll first play for you, and then I'll explain it. So the, the, the whole point of this campaign was to use the eyes, which I've recently gotten very obsessed with. Eyes are the rage right now for me. And the reason why I got into eyes was because I watched the movie Eye Origins, which I couldn't get over, which is based on Steve McCurry's work, another Nat Geo photographer. And this particular campaign uh, is based on Brian O'Hare's work on the, the eye proportions. And he basically discerned that and I hope I got his name right. But I, he basically discerned that the proportions of the human eye enables empathy far sooner than other species' eyes. And so when he had a dog on the cover of his book and had the proportions of a dog eye on it, it didn't sell as well. And the minute he replaced it with human eyes, the book sold off the shelves. And so I applied the same theory for these lines. And everybody I've, that I've shown the big cats to in, in still art in galleries haven't been able to take their eyes away from the big cat. And they will always come up to me after and ask me, why, why am I really staring intently at this cat? And it's because I've broken down the proportions so that it's, it emulates the human eye. And we wanted all eyes on big cats. Because ultimately, when you're looking at transmedia, especially when you're looking at virtual reality, we cannot have art for art's sake or virtual reality for its own sake. Any one of these media conduits need to be channeled with a story. It needs to be tethered to a story, without which it's like a vehicle that's not really going anywhere. It has no destination. Because ultimately, the story is where you end up. And the brain makes sense of the world through story. And so when you're looking at you know, just some simple statistics, why are we telling stories? It's because we're launching over 44% of satellites just to enable communication, because we want to be able to relate to one another and to gather together and, and toss ideas around and truly find a way to galvanize towards a common cause. And we do this in different ways. Also, we have the average American household looking at a television trying to derive meaning for life over eight hours. 
And of course, given the kind of content that we're channeling out there, not on Nat Geo, but otherwise, look, look at reality TV, we're really not doing them any justice. So if you're looking at even how stories are being channeled out there and how many stories we're inundated by with ad spots and everything else, we really are looking at over two story sound bites per minute. I mean, per eight seconds, sorry. Um, so I'm constantly trying to find whether it's the Serengeti lions or you know, the wild symphonies in our world or melting sea ice or basically sea life being compromised by overfishing that there's always an interesting way to communicate these stories to the public by involving concept and juxtaposing information that would otherwise seem contradictory to one another. Because it is anchored in plot for me which is to say that I define our problem and then I mind the language in which it is said because not every culture has a word for some of the problems we're trying to articulate. You always state what's obvious because you assume certain things going into any situation, but it's often not the case. We need to be on the same page for which you state the obvious. And then you have to embed the emotional triggers because that's the only way in which you're going to get people to care and connect to the information. And Marshall McLuhan back in the day said that, he's a narrative theorist in the 60s, he said that the medium is the message. And if that is the case, I would urge everyone to use their medium responsibly. Because in this particular case in Botswana, they've used the ivory to basically create an artistic educational sculpture, but all of that is gray area. And that is not smart use of ivory given that we're trying to ban it in the same right in China. So, and you don't need ivory to create campaign art or art for um, elephant protection in Africa. So here's two examples of just that, where I've created artworks that do use uh, different interpretations of ivory to exemplify the same uh, end goal. And this is another example of using the medium effectively, which is to use charcoal to communicate the, the trade in charcoal that's resulting in denudation of habitat for cheetahs. Because ultimately the way I see it, uh, the reason why I tell story upon story is because I think we as a group, when we come together and we're galvanized by a story, we have an un, like unimitable level of, um, sorry, inimitable level of like force that we can uh, unleash on the world around us to change it, to sculpt it, to shift it. And that comes from a shift in internal perspective because when each of us expresses ourselves in, in an authentic manner, we're able to basically allow voices that are unheard to channel themselves through us as vessels into the world around. And that's what I do for a while, is to give it a voice. And I think if each of you chose to express yourselves, you would be able to do the same, because there are countless lives, countless voices that need to be heard, and they can only find expression through you. Thank you. Thank you, Asher. Absolutely beautiful work. All right, next up we have Aaron Huey. So Aaron is a National Geographic photographer, a Harper's Magazine contributing editor, a Stanford School ambassador, a wearer of gold shoes, as you will soon see, a climber of rocks, a father, a husband, an artist. Huey is widely known for his 3,000 349 mile solo walk across America with his dog Cosmo. The 2002 journey lasted 154 days. There was no media coverage. They walked every step. Following the walk, Huey took a two and a half year hiatus from shooting photos to build an artist in residence program called Huey House. Hope I said that right. From the ground up on the Pecos River east of Santa Fe. His list of publications is very long and fancy. He lives in Seattle with his wife, Kristen, his son, Hawkeye, and his dog, Suki. Aaron, thank you so much. Guys, please welcome him to the stage. All right. I feel like uh, I'm gonna be taking it back to the old school with this talk. Uh, these guys and their use of uh, incredible technological camera work and art is incredibly impressive. I'm going to take you guys into the trenches uh, with me on assignment for National Geographic magazine. Um, I'm lucky enough to get to tell the stories of people and communities for the magazine. Uh, from the tribes of the Great Plains in South Dakota 
to the tribes of the Caucasus Mountains, to the Sherpas of the Himalaya, and the trappers of Alaska. Uh, when, I, when I think about how complex uh, these stories are to tell, the stories of whole communities, um, it's clear to me that how I tell these stories in the digital world is really all that matters, because that's where the layers are, and that's where these communities' voices come through. Often when we do a story, that story will define um, an entire people for generations, because we're, we're telling the one really big story about these people. Um, and I think I didn't understand how important uh, the digital aspect of our storytelling was when I started this story on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in 2011. Um, let me take you back in a time machine a little bit to remind you what was happening back then. We were still talking about blogs, and we had not yet opened an Instagram account. Um, so I knew at the time, going in, that I had this huge, almost unprecedented 42-page cover story for the print edition. But I also knew going in that that was not going to be enough. Uh, I knew that without a dramatically expanded story online uh, in our digital world, that the story just wasn't going to work. It's, it's too, com too complex of a story. Um, and it wasn't going to be able to do what the people there needed it to do. Um, a traditional narrative really only has one or two characters in it. It's what really sucks us in. And it makes the story really simple. Uh, and that's important for our, our print features. But these are not simple communities. Uh, and the communities don't feel like that kind of storytelling represents them. Um, there's just so much going on here. This is, you know. This place was born out of the American genocide, uh, the Indian Wars, the attempt to crush language and culture. Um, this is a story of deep spirituality, um, of an alternate history that we didn't learn in school. Um, it's a story about a prisoner of war camp that was later renamed an Indian reservation. Um, it's a story full of light. It's a story full of darkness. And it's a story. Uh, full of a lot of images that are neither light or dark. They just need a lot more explanation. They need space. Um, and when you look at a crowd like this, this is on Pine Ridge, these, this, all these people in, a bleacher, in the bleachers, they've, they've seen a lot of journalists come and go. And every time the journalists go, they kind of wait to see not if, but how they will be misrepresented. Uh, it's really just the nature of our business. We can't tell all their stories. Um, but I went back so many times, I desperately wanted to tell all their stories. I wanted them to be able to do that for themselves. So I started by, because I knew this was a cover story, um, giving them a chance to put themselves inside the cover. Uh, and so we did a little video experiment. Yeah, did you ever want to be on the cover of National Geographic? Yeah, but I don't know how. You don't know how? It's like this. Down a little bit, right there, perfect. Oh, you are on the cover of National Geographic. There we go. Oh, you look so good. Can I see? You can. Let's see some fists, guys. Yes, you made it. You made the cover. All right, I think I just get a shot of you here. Yeah, yeah. Made the cover. I got the cover now. So that, that was the cover of our iPad for that issue. So the, the iPad had the regular cover image, and it faded into this, and it became the stories of the people. Um, and that was a good start, but I wanted more diversity to the voices than just that. Um, I'd been told by literally every person I met on the reservation, everything that had to be in the story. I had to have a buffalo hunt. I'd have all the high school basketball stars. I'd have everybody's family histories from everybody I met. Um, and I knew I couldn't do that. And I knew the writer couldn't do that. That wasn't the place of the, the print publication. Um, so I set out to try and find a way for them to tell their own stories. And I worked with uh, an incredible um, web super genius named Jonathan Harris that a lot of you in this room might know. Um, and he helped me build this platform that allowed people on Pine Ridge to stream in any story they wanted with any imagery they wanted. This guy wanted to talk about the first racist he ever met. Um, every, story came, every story came with a photo and then text. Um, some people wanted to use family histories, a picture of a young woman's grandmother, and she wants to use this to talk about her first Sundance. Um, 
Now, what was really exciting about this was that this was, it streamed in completely unedited. Stories from prisoners, um, songs, poetry. Uh, we ended up having about 300 stories total. And even though this is kind of ancient now, all the way back in 2012, it's still live. And I just heard from a teacher today that a class is going to be streaming stories into this website tomorrow. Um, you know, people wanted to tell the story of what they think it's like to be Lakota, um, not what I think it's like. Um, the way they dance, um, their children, the games they play, their homecoming dance. Um, and this project was a huge breakthrough at the time. Nobody had ever done this before. Totally unedited streaming material going in. Um, but now it seems like ancient history because we have this, and we have things like this. Um, and now we can. I think it was around the time that we joined Instagram that the magazine started to tell us, you know, we're, we've decided you guys don't have to keep your story secret anymore. We can start to share what we're doing while we're doing it on a daily basis. Uh, and now, you know, we're at 42 million followers, and so we don't really need this. We can just ask people to do a hashtag, and their Pine Ridge story could just stream into something. Um, so entering into our post-Instagram world, I started a story on the Sherpas of Everest. And this was an opportunity for me to bring our readers with me on a parallel journey. Now, at the time, the editors didn't want me to let anyone know that the story was about the Sherpas, so that outside magazine, everybody else didn't jump in. Um, but it allowed me to take people along on my personal journey, what was happening to me every day, uh, and to create this whole other narrative about the journey. This was, you can see this is labeled day 13. This is a new kind of experience for me. This was me warming up at 20,000 feet for a larger part of the climb. Uh, I was able to take people along as I climbed Ama de Blom, uh, and ended up doing this for every single day of the entire assignment. Uh, sometimes it was video. And at the time, I was the first of our photographers to use Instagram or social media to send out a piece of the story every single day through an entire assignment, through something like 70 posts. Um, it drew in a huge audience, um, and that audience was kept getting baited in and were more and more curious about what this story was going to be, eagerly awaiting the next piece. So when on April 18th of 2014, an avalanche in the Kumbu Icefall killed what ended up being 16 Sherpas after the death toll was settled. Um, we reached out to that community that had been following in the digital world, and we asked them to come into the real world with us to help us raise money uh, to help the families of uh, those Sherpa victims. Um, we used National Geographic's Instagram feed and our own. Um, I gathered a lot of National Geographic photographers who had also shot in the Himalayas, and we launched what we called the Sherpa Photo Fund. Um, and while the news was still breaking, we started to sell prints of our National Geographic work. And all told, in eight days, that group of National Geographic photographers, pretty much solely through Facebook, Instagram, and all, everywhere we could touch in the digital world, we raised almost half a million dollars in eight days selling those prints. Um, in another story uh, that really took shape online, the magazine sent me back to the very first place that I ever made a photo essay, um, a place called Svanedia on the Georgia-Russian uh, border. Um, I was sent there to find and photograph a lot of the families that I had met 14 years ago. This is an image I took with my first camera and some of my first rolls of film in 1998. Now, those are the kind of stories that don't really translate into a feature in the print publication, but it's the perfect subject matter for what we can bring out um, online. And uh, I knew we were going to have a lot to work with. Um, for that, I utilize um, one of our outlets called Proof that really allows the photographers to tell those side stories that really have the soul. Um, and this was a story about me stumbling upon a young woman that I had photographed uh, when she was seven years old. I was on top of a 16th century tower photographing for maybe five minutes before I realized that it was a young girl I'd been searching for for a couple of years named Tata. Uh, and Proof gave me the opportunity to share that story and the story of many other young people, uh, find, kind of the reunion of finding them. Um, I'd also been doing sound recordings for 
uh, every journey that I'd ever made there. So I had sound recordings from the late 90s, the early 2000s. And in my follow-up trips, I ended up having something like a Swanish mixtape so that readers could hear all of these sound recordings that wouldn't fit into the feature. Um, I had a chance to share my first journal entries from my discovery of this place and the songs that I learned. Uh, another one of the exciting things that National Geographic has been doing um, has been the Your Shot community that really uh, brings the professional photographers into contact with, uh, with, the, with the public and says, let's interact, let's, let's do an experiment together. Now, uh, I'm going to end with this because uh, this is really about bringing us back into community-generated stories and about the next generation. I did this contest with my five-year-old son. Um, and I want to look at this because I want to look at storytelling as a teaching tool and about reaching out to our communities. Now, the reason I, I did this with my five-year-old son um, was that he shoots photos with me now. He's the youngest National Geographic photographer. He signed with National Geographic Creative at the age of four, and he's doing assignment work now for Traveler. We just finished a shoot uh, two weeks ago. Um, and you know, I end with this because we are, the stories we're telling, they're, they're for this generation now. They're going to have a much higher standard for us. Um, they're going to expect more layers. They're going to expect more voices. We need to give them, we need to give them those layers to dig through. You know, his, his storytelling is all in the digital space, the way we share our experiment as a father and son. And through this experiment, we've had um, large numbers of families reach out, asking us how to do it, um, telling us they've begun to try this with their own children because of the way we've shared our story online. Um, and that really made me want to share this with the National Geographic community. So uh, the parent child, your shot assignment was created. Um, over this series of several weeks, um, families from all over the world went out and shot in, this, in a similar way that Hawkeye and I did. Uh, they went out together, the parents and the children shooting a lot of the same subject matter. Um, and we made selections and gave live, live feedback to all of the participants. Um, it's another way that National Geographic is really reaching out to um, the public and to aspiring photographers. And we hope the result is uh, a whole new group of parent-child adventurers using their cameras um, to both teach and learn. So uh, I think Declan said, uh, the next chapter of National Geographic Storytelling is in the current issue and for the rest of the year. We have uh, an incredible series on the national park system. And I've got a Denali story and the issues you're going to get on the way out. So thank you for having me, you guys. Oh, I got to do, do one last quick fact check. National Geographic is, its fact checking is incredibly important in National Geographic. And I do have to point out that the internet actually can be stopped. I mean, this could be any number of cataclysmic events from the dying of our sun to an asteroid or a new ice age. But until it does, we're going to use the hell out of it. So thank you for having us. All right. All right, very good, all true things. Um, so right now, actually, we, uh, we had originally planned to have a Q&A with our explorers, but we thought it might be more fun if we could get you all to have those discussions with them directly over food and drinks back at the photo exhibit. So not bad. So yeah. <laughs> but, um, but before I let you guys go back over there, I just wanted to thank you so much for coming out here tonight. I, I know there's, I mentioned the whole weather thing when we were over at the exhibit. But honestly, whenever you, I mean, you're sitting down here looking around at everybody else here who is in the world of media. You're all here because you either love media, love science, or both, you know? So you guys are the movers and the changers of what is to come, not just on the internet, but the changes that we see in real life. I mean, as we've seen here with Anand, Asher, and Aaron, the media that you're doing digitally affects things in an analog way, if you, think, if you want to talk about it like that. And so, Seriously, guys, thank you so much for all the work that you do here at National Geographic with the Webbies, honoring all the work that's done. I mean, whether it's like Louis C.K. or like showing a hummingbird just going nuts, getting water off of itself, it all makes a difference. And it's because of you guys. So thank you. Thank you so much. So.
So, yeah. All right. So if you guys want to hop on up and head on over to the exhibit and we'll chat some more, I look forward to seeing you there.